good afternoon class. Did you enjoy your recess? I'm glad to hear that. Now it's time for reading time. So today you're going to sit down here in front of me and we're going to read from the class storybook. Okay. Who would like to get the first page? Rachel, what would you like to read? A fairy tale? Well, I think we can do that. Let's have a look in the book. Okay. So, this is a story we're going to read. The Exciting Life of Uncle Bobo. You can see the pictures there. Great. The Exciting Life of Uncle Bobo. So, you want to be a pilot, my lad, said Uncle Bobo to his nephew, Henry Bear. Ah, how well I remember my first days at the controls of an S-29. Of course, in those days we didn't have proper training. Pilots today don't know how lucky they are. Then they put you in the cockpit, told you what the dials meant, and let you go. I had some hair-raising experiences, I can tell you. I'll never forget flying through the blue one Saturday afternoon. The sun glinting on my goggles and looping the roof over your grandmother's house. I was flying so low that some of the her laundry got caught on the tail and I flew all the way back to base with a pair of grandfather's underpants flying out behind. He was furious, but we laughed about it together later. Gosh, said Henry, he began to think that maybe he wouldn't be a pilot after all. It would be hard to live up to Uncle Bobo's adventures. It would be much, much better to do something that no one in the family had ever done before. I've decided to be a chef when I grow up, he announced. Ah, a chef, said Uncle Bobo, when he next visited. Did I ever tell you about the time I was a professional chef for Prince Brunisky? Many's the time I've cooked a banquet for 5,000 people with only one assistant to hand me the whisks. I remember the time of King Orzanski fell headlong into one of my giant cakes. It took them three days to find him. But when they did, he was beaming all over his face and saying, Maestro, that was the finest cake I have ever had the good fortune to fall into. How we all laughed. Goodness, said Henry. It would be hard to find a prince these days, he thought, and the idea of cooking for thousands was a bit alarming. Some days it was hard enough to open the cereal box without pouring cereal all over his feet. Perhaps being a chef wasn't a good idea after all. Henry watched his aunt scurrying along the floor and rushing off to look into the dictionary. I'm going to be an entomologist, he told his family. They looked at him blankly. It's someone about who knows about insects, he replied. A few days later, there was a postcard from Uncle Bobo on the front was a picture of a tropical forest with huge red flowers and a snake in one corner. Henry read the card with a sinking feeling in his tummy. Dear Henry, it said, just a few lines from my entomological just a few lines from my entomological study tour of Brazil. This morning I discovered three species of giant ants, previously unknown to a bear. One of my assistants was carried off yesterday by a mammoth elephant moth. Poor bear. How would you like to be my assistant on my next trip? Best wishes, Uncle Bobo. Henry sighed. There must be something that Uncle Bobo hasn't done or wasn't an expert at. He thought long and hard. By the time Uncle Bobo came to his birthday party, he had decided. When I grow up, he announced, I'm going to famous Henry in the world and he looked at Uncle Bobo 
with a triumphant smile. But Uncle Bobo didn't hesitate for a second. Goodness me, young Henry, he said. How you take me back. It seems only yesterday that I changed my name to Bobo. I had to, you see. I was well, so well known that I couldn't walk down the street without being mobbed by my fans. I didn't mind too much, but it was very hard for your Auntie Hilda. I admit, I was touched when your parents decided to call you Henry after me. And now you're going to follow in my footsteps. Well, well, well. Henry just wanted to crawl under the table and disappear. Tears came in his eyes. He hoped that he would never, ever have to grow up after all. But there was a, there was a chuckle from under the other side, of, from the other side of the room. "Don't tease your poor little bear, Bobo," said Aunt Hilda. "You've only had one job in your life, and you know it. Tell Henry what you do." "I'm sorry, Henry," said Uncle Bobo. "Can't you guess? I'm a writer. I make up stories for children, just like you." and they could be about anything you can think of, even myself. Henry looked at Uncle Bobo and slowly began to understand. So you weren't a pilot or a chef or an entomologist, he said. Suddenly he began to feel a lot better. When I'm grown up, he said, I'm going to be a writer and I may have a lot to say about uncles. And that's the end of that, children. I think we have time for another story. Harry, what would you like to read? Really? Well, let's have a look in the book. Here we are, Harry, Jack and the Beanstalk. Can you see the beautiful pictures, children? Yes. Look at the pictures. Jack and the Beanstalk. It's no good, said Jack's mother one day. We shall have to sell our cow. We have no money left, and you are such a lazy, silly boy, Jack, that you will never find work. So Jack set off to the market with a cow, but on the way he met a stranger. Why walk all the way to market? asked the man. I will take the cow off your hands right away, and I will give you these magic beans in return. I think you'll agree that's a bargain. Jack was delighted to have a handful of magic beans and he handed over the cow immediately. But Jack's mother was furious. You, you are a stupid idle boy, she cried, and you will go straight to bed without any supper. And she threw the beans out of the window. The next morning when Jack woke up, he thought that the room seemed very dark. He looked out of his window and was astonished to see that there was an enormous bean plant that had grown beside the house. Its top disappeared into the clouds. Now Jack was a lazy boy, but he was a brave one too. He climbed out of the window and began to climb up the beanstalk. Jack climbed and climbed until he came to the top of the beanstalk in a land above the clouds. Far away he could see a huge castle and he set off to walk towards it. Just as night was falling, he reached the giant wooden door and knocked very loudly. A woman came to the door and looked at him, surprised. You can stay here, she said. My husband, the ogre, eats little boys. But Jack explained that he was tired and hungry, and at last the woman relented and let him come in for some bread and cheese. No sooner had Jack begun to eat when he felt the floor begin to shake. It's my husband, cried the woman. Hide, hide in the oven, quick. The ogre's mighty feet thundered across the floor, and his huge voice bellowed across the room. Fee, fi, fo, fun. I smell the blood of an Englishman. But he alive, or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. 
Nonsense, said his wife. That's just the soup ready for your supper. So the ogre sat down and ate his soup. When he had finished, he called to his wife, Bring me my hen. His wife went out and fetched a white hen. The ogre took the hen and shouted, Lay! To Jack's amazement, as he peeped out of the oven door, the hen laid a golden egg. Again and again the ogre ordered the hen to lay until there were twelve golden eggs on the table. Then the ogre fell asleep and began to snore. When he heard the ogre snoring, Jack jumped out of the oven, picked up the magic hen and ran away as fast as his legs would carry him. He scrambled down the beanstalk and stood breathless in front of his mother. Why, Jack, she cried, this is the hen that the w wicked ogre stole from your poor father. Now our troubles are over. But although Jack and his mother became quite wealthy, the boy still had the spirit of adventure. One day he climbed the beanstalk again and made his way to the ogre's castle. Once again he hid and heard the ogre's voice. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. But he alive, or he be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my Ogre's wife brought him supper, and Jack was safe. After supper, the ogre called for his money bag. As Jack watched, he counted out bags and bags of golden coins. As soon as he falls asleep, I will take those money bags, said Jack to himself. And so he did. Again, Jack's mother was delighted. This money belongs to your father too, she said. Jack decided to climb the beanstalk one more time. Everything happened just as before, but this time, after supper, the ogre called for his golden harp. When the ogre's wife brought the harp, at once the harp began to play the sweetest music Jack had ever heard. No sooner had the ogre fallen asleep, but Jack seized the harp and ran out. But the harp called out, Master, Master, and the ogre awoke. With thundering footsteps, he chased after the boy. Jack ran as fast as he could to the top of the beanstalk, but all the time he could hear the ogre getting nearer and nearer. He scrambled down as quickly as he could, but the ogre followed him. When he was nearly at the bottom, Jack called out, Mother, Mother, bring the axe. When he reached the ground, Jack took the axe, and with one great blow, he cut through the huge beanstalk. The ogre came tumbling down to his death. And as for Jack and his mother, they lived happily ever after. Did you enjoy that, class? I'm glad. So, that's all the time we have today, children. I hope you enjoyed story time. And next time somebody else can choose a tale for me to read. Mm -hmm.